The world of geopolitics is complex. It encapsulates foreign policy, defense, trade, and culture. These can have ripples that can be felt all around the planet. With that, we welcome you to The Global Detail, a podcast where we go beyond borders and behind the headlines to stories that impact the world. Our goal is to peel the onion and explore the various diverse layers through riveting interviews with experts and stalwarts. I'm Akshob Girtadas. And co-piloting this journey, I'm Brendan Duke. Let's get into it. Diversity has become quite the hot topic for discussion in recent years. As many Western nations see their populations becoming more diverse, one question that arises is, when does this become reflected in their entertainment, namely television and movies? Sujith Varghese is an actor, writer, and director whose career goes all the way back to the early days of the children's show, Fraggle Rock. These days, you would more likely recognize him as the affable Mr. Metha on the hit comedy, Kim's Convenience. The show was lauded as a loving portrait of a Korean-Canadian family running a store in Toronto. Boasting a predominantly Asian cast, the show found a dedicated following despite coming to an abrupt end after its fifth season. One of its cast members, Simu Liu, would eventually go on to get the starring role in the Marvel movie Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. In addition to Kim's convenience, Sujith has also been featured in The Expanse, a sprawling science fiction drama wherein humans have populated the solar system and have formed unique cultures around their new planetary homes. Similar to Kim's convenience, The Expanse boasts a diverse cast with many of its prominent members being people of color. The Global Detail spoke to Sajith during the height of the pandemic to get his take on the unique aspects of Canadian cinema and how the issue of diversity is being dealt with in the entertainment business today. Well, Sajit, uh, your own journey as an Indian immigrant in Canada at a very young age, uh, you know, you came from a medical background where your dad was a doctor. Um, and, you know, so there's some amount of Desi DNA of Indian and medical professionals there. Uh, but then you also adopted, uh, you know, got into film and stage, uh, stage acting at a very young age. So uh, this is, and at that time, it was certainly considered maverick. Some would even say even today, it's considered maverick to break away from the academic heavy norms of being a Desi immigrant in the West. Uh, how did this journey come about? Well, I, in, by accident, I mean, I, I was a pre-med uh, major when I was in university, um, but I was also, I checked off drama as well. So I was actually, the first university I went to, I was the first pre-med drama double major in their history. But I did all the pre-med courses, but uh, uh, I never applied for medical school because uh, at, the, at that time you could apply after one year of university. And my younger sister actually did. She became the doctor. So thank you. Thankfully, one of us carried on, but uh, uh, I never got around to applying for medical school. I, I just wanted to study other things first, uh, and um, and I, I really, to be honest, never expected to be a, a, an actor. Uh, mainly because back then there weren't any who looked like me, so I assumed that career wasn't available to me. So I studied directing and dramaturgy when I was in university, and then I went to graduate school in film and planned to be a screenwriter. And in fact, that's how I broke into television. I broke in as a writer and I wrote uh, some dramas for CBC television, which is Canada's public network. And the second one that I wrote um, was a story that came out of my own background. It was a comedy about a an Indian guy who'd grown up in Canada who had a white girlfriend his parents didn't know about. And what he didn't know is they were arranging a marriage for him with a girl from India. And we couldn't find an actor. And this was in the early 80s. And there were no brown actors of Canadian descent uh, in Toronto. And um, so the casting director went to Los Angeles to find somebody. And she came back and said, I found somebody. And I said, who? And she said, he's a young comedian. I said, fantastic. What's his name? She said, Howie Mandel. Uh, and I went, I don't think that's an Indian name. No, no, no. He's a Jewish boy, but we'll paint him brown. So I said, please give me a chance to audition for this because this is not what we want to do. And in fact, that's what they let me do. They let me audition for my own movie and I got the part and that's how I started acting. Well, lights, camera, action then. And uh, seems you never look back. Uh, 
I want to touch on one of my favorite show, uh, Kim's Convenience. Um, obviously, uh, you know, that's a show where we connected. It's a show that I first got introduced to your work. Um, it's one of the shows I love. Um, it's it's uniquely Canadian. Um, and here's the part that, you know, if I could juxtapose it, like Canadian actors have never been rare. Uh, you see them on Hollywood from time memorial, right? Right from Jim Carrey, Ryan Gosling, Ryan Reynolds, Mike Myers, Seth Rogen, stars like Celine Dion, Brian Adams. But it's never a sense of a separate Canadian identity when we saw them in Hollywood for a lot of the, the roles and parts they played. Uh, but Kim's Convenience for me touches on a few things. Obviously, it was a play turned into a series on Netflix, um, a show I fell in love with. I introduced to my parents, uh, just everyday humor. What I love about these shows are a couple of things. Uh, one, of course, is the fact that it touches on diversity. It shows a Korean immigrant family, uh, yourself, your character, who was an Indian person in Mr. Metta. There's Mr. Chen, a Chinese person. Um, and I don't think it was a show was trying to do anything more than just be itself. And, you know, just words like Amma and Appa as a Tamilian, where we use that for our parents. Uh, I didn't realize that Koreans use the same for their parents. Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, this show, essentially, and what Kim's Convenience was trying to convey. Uh, was it just, you know, talking about the immigrant identity in Canada or just everyday life and just your own experience of being on Kim's Convenience? So just unpack that for me. Well, yes, absolutely. I mean, the thing about Kim's Convenience, when it started, it was a play. It started as a play and became a very big hit in Canada, all across the country. It toured and was, I think they must have done a year's worth of performances all across the country. And that's when the idea of transferring it into a TV series began. Um, and the TV show is actually quite different than the play. The play is much more serious. Uh, it, there is humor in it, and the characters are there, Appa and Amma and Jung, you know, Jung and all that. But the tone is a bit more um, uh, naturalistic rather than co comedic. But when they... Uh, reinvented it for television. They made it more of a, a, of a comedy. And I remember when it started, I thought, you know, this is just the most fantastic love letter to the city of Toronto uh, because it, it is absolutely authentic to to where I live, Toronto. Uh, the Korean convenience stores, they're all over the place. Uh, the, the, the customers, you know, of different uh, ethnic backgrounds. I mean, that is the reality of this city. And I thought, Anybody in this city will love the show. Nobody outside the city will even understand it. And it blew me away that not only was it a popular in the rest of Canada, but it became popular around the world. And, you know, we get fan mail from Malaysia and, what you know, places that, that the, the specifics are very different. But the, the emotional resonance that the show had carries, uh, you know, throughout the globe. And that, to me, is what makes me very proud to be a part of it. Uh, and I didn't expect that. I honestly thought it was going to be a little Canadian TV show that would be lucky to last one season because nobody outside the city of Toronto would even care about it. And I was very wrong. Um, but I will say that in the play, you know, Mr. Meta and his family, they're not part of the original play. So many of those characters that are in the series were invented for the series. And, uh, and in fact, if you want a little story about how I got cast, I originally Please. auditioned... <laughs> I originally auditioned for the series for a different part, but a similar role in that he was a friend of of, um, of Mr. Kim's, and I didn't get it. And then the series started shooting, and I think it was about halfway through season one, my agent got a call and said, you know, there's this other part. Uh, we liked his audition. We never showed it to the network, but we'll show them this audition from his original time. And uh, if they like it, he'll play this other part for one episode. And and that's what happened. They cast me as this Mr. Meta character for one episode. Um, and I had actually worked with Paul in a movie six months earlier. So we knew each other. And I guess the chemistry was already there because as soon as uh, we did the rehearsal, they booked me for two more episodes and uh, in season one. And when I read the scripts for those second two episodes, I realized that most of the dialogue that I had auditioned for that original character had been transferred to this new Mr. Meta character. So so clearly something didn't work out with whoever got the part originally. And uh, I ended up playing uh, Mr. Meadow in, you know, for five seasons. 
uh, I remember watching uh, season five of Kim's Convenience during the pandemic. I'd watched four seasons, binged watched it, and I was so excited when season five came out. And uh, I promised myself to sparse it out because I didn't want to <laughs> lap it all up at once. Otherwise, I'd have Kim's Convenience FOMO. Uh, but tell us what filming like was during the pandemic. It's unprecedented for all of us. But, you know, your job is such that you can do this virtually. So apart from delays, what was filming like during the pandemic? We had we had um, been renewed for season five and season six before COVID. Uh, we finished season four before COVID, and we would have started season five uh, around. Well, we were normally shooting from sort of May until July, the season. So COVID kind of kicked in in March. So th that season five was delayed. Uh, it was delayed until the fall. Uh, and that's when we did season five. And we did season five under very different conditions, obviously, than we did the other seasons because there were COVID protocols put in place by um, the film industry and by the government that that made it very different. But we were still able to do the show. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think you can tell the there's there's any sort of logistical difference between shooting between the end product of seasons one to four and then what we did in season five. Um, but it, but it was, you know, obviously a very different kind of production, um, uh, you know, because of the, because of the COVID protocols, but, uh, to, to everyone's credit, you know, I don't think there were any, um, positive tests while we were filming and, um, and they got it done. Um, yeah, uh, obviously it's been unprecedented, the pandemic. Uh, in fact, Brandon and I came up with the show during the pandemic, interviewing people like yourselves, uh, on Clubhouse. Um, I think what I want to touch on with Kim's Convenience is I touched on the Korean identity, but, uh, you know, growing up miles away from the U.S. and Canada and now living in the U.S., um, there's always this relative homogeneity that people outside Canada may have seen. There's a you know, U.S. and Canada in country codes and the great white north. And, uh, you know, there's a sense of facetiously calling Canada sometimes a 51st state um, just because of the likeness to the United States. And the U.S. obviously uh, occupies this a uh, really larger than life era in uh, soft power and hard power. But what I wanted to ask you is like, you know, shows like say How I Met Your Mother consciously mention Canada and of course, facetiously talk about Canada and spoof it. There are shows that are more animated like South Park that overtly, you know, rip on Canada. But the thing with Kim's convenience is I watched it without even knowing it was Canadian, right? I mean, I knew it was um, the West and uh, largely because of American Hollywood, I just took it as American until I saw words like Toonie and Hydro Bill and talking about kilometers. And then I see the CN Tower in the background, which I'm like, oh, that's Toronto and downtown Toronto. So was the show trying to be Canadian without mentioning Canada too much? Well, I, I would disagree. I think it portrayed Canada by trying to be Canada. It portrayed Toronto by being as Toronto as it could be. You know, I, I don't think, to be honest, I don't think anybody working on the show was smart enough to disguise what the show was about, which was about this city and of this family. And so, uh, you know, everybody was just working on what they knew in terms of trying to write the stories that came from the city that we live in. And, and, and it was just the, the surprise is that it, it appealed to so many people outside the people who would know the reality of what we were writing about, or not I was writing, but what the writers were writing about. You know, I just remember Paul Lee, uh, the main protagonist of Kim's Convenience, uh, Mr. Kim or Appa, as we've come to know him, uh, talk about diversity and the importance of, you know, the Korean identity, the Korean Canadian identity in this case. And um, it brings an interesting subject of diversity right now. We obviously there's a political consciousness movement of BLM and LGBTQ identity in cinema. But diversity in Hollywood was seen as, you know, in phases and stages, right? From uh, side actors and side mentions. And if you go way back, there were stereotypical roles of, you know, uh, even in The Simpsons of uh, Apu, the you know, you know, quickie mart owner. Uh, but to now being mainstream, I mean, Kim's Convenience is front and center about a Korean 
uh, family and, you know, you have uh, Indian people like yourself and Chinese characters coming in and you don't even see too many white Canadians in the show except for, you know, side actors and uh, the occasional appearances. Um, is this show the new yardstick that you'd like to think that's raised the bar for diversity across yeah, the but you see this is this is what i'm this is what i'm trying to say abhishek that the abhishek the the reality of canadian drama and canadian television like kim's convenience is the fourth uh series that i've recurred or been a series regular on playing an indian character uh uh, y- you know, before Kim's Convenience, we had a show called Little Mosque on the Prairie, which is actually a big international hit too. About uh, in 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 the late two thousands, and it was about Muslims in a small town in Saskatchewan. And before that, I was on a show called Metropia, which was a nighttime soap. The entire cast and set of characters were diverse. Uh, before that, I was on a show called An American in Canada, which was a sitcom. And I played an Afghan immigrant who owned a donut store that the series lead went to get advice from every episode. So so Canada has been doing this and reflecting the diversity of our population. Like I said, I started in Canada uh, in 1982. I wrote this movie that I started, which was about you know diversity. It was probably the first thing they ever did. Uh, so it's been it, we've been doing it for 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 35 years in Canada. It's just that with Kim's and to some degree Little Mosque on the Prairie, it it went across borders and people saw it outside Canada. So I don't know if people in Canada take it, you know, as some big radical um, revelation of diversity as perhaps Amer- and an American audience would, because it's much more. Um, common here that we we did this kind of stuff and also UK drama it's the same thing for UK television but uh, but it, you know it's the success is what is quite unique for a Canadian show that was different um, I think the funny thing about Kim's convenience is it's just had such a global appeal uh, I was introduced to it by someone who is of Chinese origin but Australian and I know the show has taken off in places like Indonesia, even Russia and Singapore and the US obviously and in South Asia. Uh, what's been the global appeal for the show? Um, what's been the appeal in Korea? Because there's always been a tendency sometimes where, uh, you know, when a, when, a, when a family of a certain ethnicity is portrayed in the West um, and the reaction back home is, I you know, a positive at times, but sometimes people may feel as a caddy catching or accentuating certain stereotypes. So what's been the appeal uh, for the Korean diaspora, particularly, you know, back in Korea as well? Well, it, you know, it's a big hit in Korea. Uh, with the cast, the series leads went to Korea to get a huge award, the equivalent of the Korean Emmy Award um, for the show. So I guess it's working for the actual Korean audience too. Uh, you know, we get we I get tweets from all over the world. Uh, uh, the cast on Kim's has been pretty active on Twitter and and very open about engaging with people and 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 we get tons of tweets from everywhere i have uh, from all over the world i get i get um fan tweets uh so i mean that's unique because you know in in all the other shows i've ever done they have uh, cross borders but you never heard about it because we didn't have twitter back then but now we do and so the fans get in touch and it's quite amazing as i said i never thought the show would transfer outside the 416 area code which is the Toronto area code, and it's it's reached an audience all over the world. And I think it's because it's so specific and that the specifics of the show make people relate to it. It's sort of like how that movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, was so successful all over the world, even though you didn't have to be Greek. You know, Chinese people loved it, uh, you know, because they recognized... They recognize themselves, they recognize their friends and family, not because they're seeing literally themselves, but they're seeing they're seeing through the ethnic uh, specifics and seeing the, the people. Uh, and that's who everybody relates to. Uh, and and I also think that the specifics fi- make it interesting. You know, like the, you learn a lot about Korean food watching Kim's Convenience. And uh, I think people really find that interesting if you're not part of that culture. Just to talk about diversity again, you touched on how Canadian diversity is more natural. So if you were to juxtapose this with American diversity and American diversity in cinema, would you say there's a little more contrived element? Um, What makes Canadian diversity just so different from diversity in Hollywood? Well, I think there's a, I think there's a, um, 
the difference is that and this is just my opinion, but my sense of the American push towards diversity is that it's a business decision. Uh, they recognize now that there's an audience that wants to see themselves and they will enhance their ratings. They will enhance their box office if they en engage and embrace with that audience. I don't think it's a sort of a artistic or cultural decision so much as, I mean, it is for the filmmakers, but in terms of the green lighters, I, I think it's a business decision. Whereas Canada, uh, you know, it's, it's more of a, uh, you know, a reflection of the, of our work. Um, political reality, which is that we're a multicultural country. And, and you know, the, the, the percentage, for example, of South Asian people in Canada um, is much higher than the percentage of South Asian people in the United States. Uh, and, and so all sort of quote unquote ethnic minorities have a have, are in sharper relief uh, in, in Canada because our percentages are higher. Um, so you know, for that reason, I think that the impulse to to do something comes from um, a more uh, organic place uh, uh, rather than a business uh, place. But that's just my opinion. I mean, the, you know, I tracked the the flip side of that is I tracked uh, my parts on my resume. You know, I've done like a lot of American shows because a lot of American movies and TV shows shoot in Canada. And I would say that uh, if I did, if I played an immigrant, but the immigrant was in an American show, I, I spoke with my normal, you know, American with Canadian accent. If I played an immigrant in a Canadian show, I spoke with a, an Indian accent, even though that's not my natural speaking voice. So there's a flip side to that too, in that, in that there's a, you know, a, a, a sort of a, a desire to reflect the immigrant experience more than a kind of, you know, they're just around experience, which is what the Americans do. Like I was on a show called Mayday, which is about airplane disasters. And I was playing the, the um, air traffic controller in Mauritius. And Mauritius is a very interesting country because the accent that they have, if they speak English, is a kind of combination of Hindi and French because of their you know, colonial past. And I, when I got cast, I, I, my friend was the AD on the show. And I said, look, man, I'm going to learn this accent really well, because I know a guy from Mauritius and I'll hang out with him and get the accent down. And he put the phone down for a second. I heard some talking in the background and some yelling going on. And he says, uh, no accent. Don't do an accent. I said, what do you mean? The show's on National Geographic in the US and they don't want any accents. I'm going, National Geographic doesn't want an accent. So if you watch the show, I'm a Mauritian air traffic controller speaking like an American. American. Uh, so, I mean, I'm visually from Mauritius, but audibly not. Uh, so, th so that's what I mean by, you know, I think it's a business decision more than a, a, a creative one. Just touch on this accent part more, because normally when diverse characters are introduced into mainstream cinema in Hollywood, uh, there is perhaps a contrived notion of overplaying an accent, which is why Sometimes people see it as a caricature or stereotype. So how did you approach your character, Mr. Mehta, with an accent? I'm just curious about, uh, even though you're an Indian person, but you have a Canadian accent by virtue of being raised in Canada. But how did you approach the treatment, as we say in cinema, how do you approach the treatment of this character? No, no, I, I brought that to the party in that, you know, when, when, when the character requires an accent, I try to figure out, well, what does that mean in terms of their background and their history and all that, so that the accent has a, some authenticity, at least for me as an actor to play, and hopefully for the audience in, in watching me do it. So that on Little Mosque on the Prairie, for example, he was a, is a Muslim guy, but he was more of a, a working class fellow who was in a small town in Saskatchewan. So that accent was different. For Mr. Mehta, you know, I read that first script, and and I don't know if you, I'd have to explain it, but in the scene that I was doing, I talk about cricket and I realized, well, you know, he's, he, he's experienced, you know, he, he, he's into cricket. So there's a clue there that he's probably not 
um, you know, a, a lower class fellow. I mean, he's he's kind of got a bit of erudition about him. So using that clue in the text, you know, I invented that accent. And there's a manner of speaking that he had, which is sort of, you know, he shouts a word once in a while. And that I stole from somebody I know. Uh, my spouse's boss <laughs> sort of speaks that way. So I kind of used that plus the posh accent and... Um, and that's what I decided to do. And it seems to have worked. You know, I think for me as the million in Southern Indian, the part that really tickled me the most is seeing the phrase Amma and Appa used for mother and father, because that's what we use in Tamil a lot. And uh, I think even for the diaspora in India, uh, particularly Southern Indian diaspora, they'd really be able to find the easiest way to relate to the show, you know, apart from a deferentialness to parents and Asian culture of subservience sometimes to parents. There's also, um, you know, this word Amma and Appa. And uh, who would have thought Salem, Tamil Nadu and Seoul, South Korea have this in common? Um, you as an Indian actor in Southern Indian, did did you find this news to you as well when you first read the script? Yeah, I mean, I, I was quite surprised. The The only difference is, you know, in Malayalam, we would say uh, Amici and Apachanin or whatever, and then shorten it to Ami and Api. Or my, my niece, when she was born, couldn't say Apachan and Amici for grandpa and grandma. So she would say Ami and Api. And that's how, you know, you, you, you know it. I mean, that's it's sort of such a natural thing for, for Asian people to to say um the, the difference is that in the in the scripts for kim's convenience amma is u m m a and that's different than what i would see uh you know we always thought a a m m a or something like that but that's the only difference and it, it i agree with you it's quite charming that that two different vastly different cultures would have a similar uh, uh you know term of endearment well, at this point, I'd be remiss, uh, Sujit, if I did not hand it over to my creative partner and co-host of this podcast, Brandon Duke. Uh, Brandon, of course, is uh, a cinema aficionado uh, and the creative and musical talent behind this, putting this podcast together. Uh, Brandon, of course, has a lot of expertise in the media arts industry, particularly a very unique connoisseur of Southern culture in the United States. So, uh, Brandon, over to you. Hello, Sajith. Um, circling back to the diversity question, do you see things getting better in that front? Like we will continue to see uh, more representation of, you know, Indian Americans or Indian Canadians for that matter. Um, how do you see that unfolding? Oh my gosh! Uh, listen, the my the kids in their twenties and thirties who are in the Canadian show business anyway of they see background they work all the time. You know, their 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 um their careers are exponentially better than mine was when I was their age. Uh, so the change is here. It is not a um, it's not a radical thing anymore for a Daisy person to go into the arts. Uh, I know many, and they are all working. Um, in regards to education, you mentioned you had a double major in theater and pre-med, but do you feel that you missed anything perhaps by not focusing more exclusively on theater? Well, the thing is, I, I never studied acting even when I was in university, and yet I've spent 40 years as an actor. So my feeling is that, uh, you know, the st- the study of the arts is is useful, but it isn't a, it isn't the path necessarily to a career in the arts. Um, so when I studied in the arts, I studied Shakespeare and I studied Greek and Roman mythology, and I was like you know getting a good liberal arts education, but I wasn't really specializing in performance and the things that a lot of people nowadays do. And frankly, I think that put me in good stead uh, when I started working professionally because and I, I taught acting at the college level for a number of years. And I was always concerned that the kids who are in their, you know, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old studying acting at that time, it was a little almost too early for them. I wanted, I wish that they would, you know, have expanded their horizons and, and studied anything, everything, you know, and, and, you know, later worry about, 
acting per se. So, you know, I have personally, I have mixed feelings about the, the, the value of the arts as a, as a specialty in, in a uh, university. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but I'm saying you should really have as wide a possible educational horizon because you don't know what you're going to need when it comes to actually having a resource to use in, in an employment situation. You just don't know. And the more you have under your belt in terms of knowledge, um, the better you're going to be as an artist. I, I want to talk about The Expanse, which for anyone who doesn't know, it's a phenomenal sci-fi show on Amazon. But one of the things that's most impressive about the show is the realism or the grounded quality of that. Can you talk about like what are some of the things that – you, the actors and the the crew, writers, directors, et cetera, do to, you know, bring that to the screen. You know, I've actually worked on The Expanse since the pilot, uh, uncredited as one of the background voice uh, voices. So I was taught uh, the Belter accent and the Belter language in order to be able to do that. Because every time you see a scene with a crowd in it, you can, you, you my voice is there, uh, either pretending to be a Belter or an Earther or a Martian or whatever. And that I've done that since the pilot. I just did season six episodes yesterday. I still do them. Uh, when I got cast on camera for as David Pastor, what was interesting was I only, I didn't audition with the scene that I ended up doing. They gave me a scene from a previous season of some other character. So they were really looking for the character, not you know, not specifically the particular scene that they would end up doing. So I think that that was part of it. Um, when I got cast, I had no idea where they were going to take the character. I only knew that first scene. If you remember um, that first scene in episode 506, where I meet Avasarela for the first time, he's a very timid, uh, you know, over his head kind of guy. Um, and I had no idea where they were going to take him because I hadn't read the other scripts and they didn't tell me. So it was a real adventure as an actor to to discover that's where they were going to take the character and i honestly give them all the credit for having the faith in me that i could do it because it was a fantastic character to play in the end now specifically you know uh if you remember that first scene 506 in 506 he talks about the low gravity situation well before we shot that scene uh you know like a week before i had to take a session in low gravity with the show's uh, uh, sort of gravity expert. Um, And, you know, he showed me a lot of videos and he explained how uh, it would be in a low gravity setting. And, you know, just for that one line that I was supposed to have saying that I had, you know, I was getting used to the gravity, they wanted me to understand the science really well of being in low gravity. And that is true for that entire series. They put so much thought and effort into getting the science right on every level for every character, every situation, every, you know, uh, graphic. I mean, they when they have uh, spaceships firing guns, you see them fire guns under thrust because otherwise they would go off into the other direction. I mean, you know, it shows you how, how nonsensical Star Wars is and how they have space battles because uh, the expanse is, you know, is scientifically uh, accurate. So that is something that's part and parcel of the show. And it stems to the original writers of the books who are also the writers of the series. And, and they make sure that that is part and parcel of how that show gets made. And it's quite something, the, the level of care that they, that that's put into it. Um, the second part of your question, I, I, you know, it's very difficult to be predictive in terms of how to be uh, an artist. Uh, and and I, I think what you see in, in the case of good writing is that they're being authentic and they're being authentic to what they know, what they understand, what they care about, what they are interested in. And those guys who write The Expanse, you know, if you meet them, you realize that's who they are as people and that's what they care about. And the history and the politics that they put into that show come from their own you know passion and and i think that's what you have to be true to uh and there's no easy way to do that other than be true to yourself and and be the operating at the highest level that you can since you've been spending so much time acting i'm curious if you wanted to get back to doing writing and directing and if so 
what stories would you like to see told? Well, as I mentioned, I started as a writer and I wrote a lot of Canadian television. I'm one of the original writers of the Muppet series Fraggle Rock, actually. I wrote 10 episodes and Jim Hansen directed one of them. And, you know, I worked on that show for four seasons. So my my roots are in writing. Um, I was the first minority to go to the Canadian Film Center, which is, a, you know, it's a very prestigious film program that or film school that was founded by Norman Jewison and who's, you know, a well-known director. So, yes, the short answer is I've always <laughs> had ambitions of, of writing, and I still uh, write and, and I do direct. I haven't been able to get a feature film financed yet, but, uh, you know, I'm not dead yet, so hopefully something will happen before that happens. Um, I have... Um, a very eclectic thematic background as a as a creator you know as i said i i wrote the first sort of multicultural romantic comedy cbc television ever made and i also wrote for the muppets so that's pretty wide ranging um interests and uh, you know i would say that as I age, I'm more interested in trying to tell stories that are closer to my heart, but not necessarily my own story, but a story that that matters to me. So I'm, you know, I'm, um, uh, so, so it's it's difficult to sort of pin that down, but. Uh, you know, the things that I have worked on or the things that I, I hope to get made are are stories that are just matter to me, you know, in terms of some of them have diverse sort of cultural aspects to them. Some, some of them come from my, you know, my uh, interest in medicine. I mean, my father was a neurosurgeon and I remember watching the very first uh Christmas special, I guess, for the show ER. And I saw George Clooney and Noah Wiley and all these white guys in the hospital on Christmas Eve. And I said, God damn, that is a lie. There's only Hindus, Muslims and Jews working in the hospital on Christmas Eve. And so ever since then, I've wanted to do a show set in the hospital on Christmas Eve uh, with Hindus, Muslims and Jews, you know. So so it's it's uh, like I said, it's coming from your my own sort of interests and themes. And who knows, we'll, so hopefully something will happen. Um, I have to ask, would you have been up for a Mr. Metha spinoff if the Kim's Convenience creators had been game to do it? I would have, I would have killed, I, I would have killed for them to spin off Mr. Metha into his <laughs> own show. And I thought there, I thought it was, that's a good idea. You know, uh, it's not something they considered, but, uh, it's a, I think it's an opportunity gone. Um, in, in terms of representation, do you see more stories like that getting made or at least having the possibility of getting made? So I, I don't know if I'll be able to get things like that done, but I know somebody will. And, and they are. I mean, it's happening now. You know, Kim's Convenience is not the first. It's the latest in a long line of things that have come out of Canada. And I, I think there's going to be many more. I, I'm, what I would love to see is... Uh, you know, what's interesting is that now with streaming, we're see we're able to see other countries shows more easily than we ever did. You know, as I said, uh, uh, I have fans from all over the world because they've seen Kim's convenience and that's a first for me. I've been working for many years and I didn't know anybody from outside the country, you know? Um, and I think that we're able to now see programs from England and from, uh, France. I mean, there's a big show on Netflix called Lupin that is, you know, centered around a black uh, thief in in France. And you know, this kind of cross pollination of of uh, storytelling that is happening around the world. I mean, I see more Indian films now than I ever did because they're all on Amazon Prime. You know, Malayalam cinema of all things. I mean, I see all these films. So, you know, we are we are uh, the the borders are. Are, are ending, you know, and, and what will be interesting to see is how the storytelling and the cultural aspects of it evolve as, as our borders disappear in terms of what we watch on, on our screens. Uh, because I, even now I can see, you know, that Indian cinema is embracing a certain sort of Hollywood style to it in a way that it hadn't as much before. And I hope that maybe that 
some of the Indian cinema transfers to other countries' uh, background because there is an opportunity to um, develop a kind of new storytelling that is global. And, uh, you know, we might not recognize what we will see in 30 years compared to what we're seeing now. A lot of times in TV and movies, you see kind of two extremes of the Indian experience, I guess, the super poor or quote unquote slum dog version or the super rich. What are your thoughts on that? I guess, in especially in terms of, you know, authenticity or, you know, portraying that experience. You have, you have to understand one thing, you know, I grew up in Canada and so my cultural touchstones are from that experience from growing up here when i watch indian cinema it's a foreign country's art for me and i admire it respect it and i recognize some of it because i've been to india and i you know my family is there but it is not coming you know it's not my storytelling right and and so what i'm going to be able to do is not going to be an indian quote unquote thing uh it will it will be coming out of my own particular experience, which is where I think a show like Kim's Convenience comes out of. I mean, Ian's, you know, is a Canadian of Korean background. So he, you know, it's, it's, it's a very particular experience. Uh, what I'm saying is not that the Indian films are superior or not superior or anything like that. I'm just saying that as we uh, expand the ability to see each other, every other country's um, work, uh, the the cultural differences may or may not uh, shift. Right now, there's a big difference between Indian cinema, particularly the regional cinema, and Hollywood. But uh, I can see them embracing Hollywood technical stylistic choices in some of their work now. And and I think it's because of this cross-pollination that's happening. They're trying to appeal to a Western audience of Indian people but who are, you know, watching on Amazon or whatever, as much as they're trying to, you know, make their work be more sophisticated in their own minds anyway, for their homegrown audience. So I think there's a very interesting um, transition that's happening now. I don't know where it's going to go, uh, but it's very difficult to be predictive of it. That's all I'm saying. Um, with Korean cinema, it seems like it is really, really uh gotten to a new level on the world stage with a uh, parasite winning the best picture oscar also uh yaon yujung if i'm i apologize if i'm butchering that name um with uh her winning the role of a uh, best supporting actress in uh you know playing the grandmother in minari um it seems like korean cinema is kind of having a i don't know crossover for appeal for lack of a better term um but Indian cinema, while being very popular and certainly not hurting for money, hasn't quite had the same, I guess, uh, transition as far as reaching the global audience. I, I'm pretty aware of Korean cinema and Indian cinema. And Korean cinema, I'm sorry, superior. It is one of the best cinemas in the world. It's technically fantastic. The acting is incredible. The scripts, you know, uh, Parasite is just the tip of an iceberg. I mean, there are so many fantastic films that have come out of Korea for the last 20 years. Um, my feeling is that their cinema did what India's cinema did not, which is that they uh, tried to tell the, the most successful stories they could and learn from their mistakes and learn from their failures and built up a national cinema that so now you've got people who are were operating at the highest level and can win the oscar you know uh indian cinema it's all uh they're going for a more lower lo level you know they want the biggest audience but not necessarily the the best storytelling you know what i mean like they know that if we get the right song and the right you know hunk starring and the right hot actress in it the male film will make money and that's all that it seems to matter you know and so i i watch these indian films particularly the bollywood ones and i go ah oh, you know this is silly it's just not you know whether it's drama or comedy or whatever it's it's not 
you know, it's not uh, high level work. Uh, and I don't mean everything has to be highbrow. I, I'm, I'm a big, you know, I love Marvel movies just like everybody else. It doesn't have to be highbrow, but it does have to recognize the the audience is really craving sophisticated storytelling. And the Korean cinema has has developed a very sophisticated level of storytelling, as you see in, in that movie, uh, Parasite. And I think India has a long way to go to catch up to that. So. Yeah. Piggybacking on that idea is, as you mentioned earlier, um, like so you're seeing some of the younger generation in the uh, South Asian community working a lot. Do you think at some point, as I guess the uh, the South Asian community gets more representation, like say an American and Canadian stuff, that that will eventually start to influence like Indian cinema. And then maybe they start to maybe they see like a chance for like an audience in the States or in Canada. And then maybe they start to change and then it starts to feed, you know, they get like a little feedback loop going where each side starts to influence the other. Do you see the possibility of that happening at all? I don't know. Um, there's not a lot of. You know, it, it's early days yet in terms of their filmmakers being aware of what we do in Canada and the U.S. and what Canadian filmmakers are aware of in, in there. And the markets are so different or have been. You know, I remember I went to India, uh, it was like 20 years ago, and I met with producers there because I was pitching something that was partly set in India. And, uh, and you know, Canada has... Um, what are called co-production treaties with most countries around the world. Uh, and they have one with India, but it's never, or at that time, it had never been used. And because it requires compromise on both countries' producers' parts in order to, for them to make that treaty co-production work. And I asked this producer, I think he was in Chennai, and I asked him, so why doesn't, isn't that happening? And he says, why should I compromise my content for your market? I have 250 million middle class people in this country. That's enough to make me a profit. I don't need to compromise my content to appeal to a Canadian audience as well. So, you know, I, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, I, I look at a, a film like White Tiger. Have you seen that? It's on um, Netflix and it's become yeah. quite, quite popular on, on Netflix. So there is a there is a way of, of making something that is particularly Indian uh, appeal to, a, 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 you know, an international audience, I think. But as to, uh, you know, as to the specifics of whether that's going to happen or how and when, I honestly don't know. I mean, I, it really it really depends on so many factors that are really beyond kind of the artistic question and and have to do with, you know, who's green lighting this week and who's who's in charge of that network. And, you know, there's so many. I mean, I think as as we, you know, in, in five years or 10 years, we'll know more. But I think it's too soon to tell. Um, circling back to the expanse, a show, which I'm actually a really big fan of. And if anyone hasn't seen it, they should go check it out on Amazon. Um, talk a little bit more about just working on that show and, you know, the different, you know, what, like just your experience working on, you know, what probably is one of the best sci-fi shows on television. I mean, I, I love working on the expanse. I mean, I still work on it. As I mentioned, I do background uh, voices for it. So I, I've been part of the show since the pilot. Um, you know, to say something other than what I said earlier, uh, the, 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 you know, uh, Sheree, uh, working with Sheree uh, is like a career highlight. And they've gone to the trouble of casting somebody who is so unique as an actor uh, to play her. And, you know, she, she elevates the character to being, you don't believe, you don't believe that they, she's written, you know, like you feel like this is, this character just exists in this world. And I think that's true for many of the, of the characters. And uh, so, yeah, to be a part of that, to work with her, a tremendous uh, thrill. Uh, I like to think I held my own. And, and the, what was interesting was after we shot our first scene, Sheree came up to me and she said, you've done theater, haven't you? I said, uh, actually, yeah, I'm about to do a play. I'm about to... I knew it. I knew it. I'm so glad they find, found somebody who's done theater because that is the heart of being an actor. You have to be able to do theater and not just be look good on camera. And, and uh, I thought that was very interesting that she felt uh, it was so important, you know, to, to have a theater background 
even when you're doing film and television. And frankly, I agree with her. Uh, and I think Denzel Washington said the same thing. I saw an interview with him and he said, you know, you build a character for four weeks of rehearsal and then do a four to 12 week run and then come onto my set and show me who you are as on camera. Because until you've done that, you're not really, you know, doing the work of being an actor. And I, and there's some real truth to that. And, and uh, the irony is, of course, that not all stage actors are successful on film and TV. And there's lots of film and TV actors who've never done a play. But I, you know, I, I like to try and do a play every every couple of years or so. I mean, it's, it's difficult because they don't pay very well, but it's artistically very important. Anyway, that was my experience working with her. I mean, she's fantastic. And I, and, uh, and I would kill to work with her again. Um, going back to Kim's convenience, uh, Simu Liu posted a, a, uh, a lament, you might say, um, laced with some criticism about the, the way Kim's convenience came to an end namely uh stuff to do with the producers and the uh the writers room especially in just regards of trying to keep the representation of the asian community true and uh things like that um how did you see that all going down from your end well first of all i wasn't in the writers room i was only a cast member so i i relied on the writers to do the writing um look it's a very complicated uh both contractually and emotionally, you know, the ending of Kim's Convenience. I, I was shattered uh, when I got a call from our executive producer saying season six, because we had been greenlit for season six. And frankly, I thought we'd go for another, you know, we'd, be, we'd have 10 seasons. I thought the final season would be up uh, taking, letting this, his grandson take over the store or something, you know? So, so, uh, so I think I got the call about season six, not happening. Uh, but after the, in Canada, after the first two or three or four episodes of season five had aired on CBC here. So it was in May sometime. And uh, it shattered me, I, I will admit. I mean, I loved playing Mr. Meta. I would have been happy to play him forever. I will miss playing him forever. And it, it broke my heart so much that I have not seen the rest of season five. I've never watched the last seven or eight episodes because I, I can't bring myself to. Um, I, I totally agree. Uh, you know, I support what Simu and what Jin Yoon have said about the show. There were um, problems uh, behind the scenes in terms of maintaining the authenticity. Ince was really the guy trying to pr protect the authenticity of the show. And he he was not, um, a, you know, he, he, he was the only one. I think everybody else really just wanted, and I'm not saying they were wrong. I'm just saying that their interests were in trying to make the show funny and successful and have, have high ratings, but I don't think they cared as much about the specific cultural authenticity that, um, that I think made the show work. And that's what was so frustrating about how it ended was that it, it did not end in a way that, um, it deserved. And so, uh, all I can say is I, I am as heartbroken as Simu is about the ending of the show. And, uh, it affects me a little less cause I was only recurring and I didn't, you know, I wasn't a series lead. And so it, it I was already doing other things, you know, I had to, because it's, uh, it wasn't paying my hundred percent of my <laughs> income or anything, but I think for the series leads, it was a very difficult thing to go through to have that show end the way it did. And the, you know, the thing is, I worked with Paul shooting the scenes for season five, and I've never been able to see him since the show ended. I, we never got a chance to say goodbye. We never had a party. We never, you know, we didn't have our victory lap, as he calls it. And that's really hard when you work on something like this, because when you work on a show, whatever show, every show, every play, every movie, you become family. Um, it's just the nature of the work. Sometimes that family is dysfunctional. Sometimes it's uh, glorious, but it is a family. And in this case, our family disintegrated without us having a chance to say goodbye. And that's probably the hardest um, thing to, to take away from Kim's. But, you know, I'm grateful that I got a chance to be a part of it. And, uh, and I'm proud of the work that we did. And, and I'm, I know that what we did will live on. So there's that, but it's, it's unfortunate and sad that it ended the way it did. 
Um, now that Kim's convenience is sadly over, at least for the time being, uh, what were some of your favorite scenes or, you know, stories from uh, working on that show? Well, <laughs> uh, you know, they, I, I always got a kick out of the writing on almost all of them. I was really, um, I was really thrilled at, at the places they took um, up on Mr. Meta, uh, sp- particularly in terms of telling the truth about, you know, there's one scene I remember where they talked about how, um, you know, they, 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 uh, Korea and India are really come, you know, operating at a high level now. And, and, and they started re- regretting coming to Canada. Um, and, you know, I mean, there's some kind of, there's some kind of truth in all of that, that the grass was always greener and, you know, you, you've got to play the card you're dealt with. And this is, you know, and so there's some, something beautiful about that. I mean, the, the, for me, it wasn't so much the specific scenes. It was working with the people and working with Paul was a, a real joy. And, and, you know, he's just a fantastic guy and we just had fun, you know, it was just a, it was the easiest thing in the world to act those scenes with him um just because i guess you know we were both born to play those parts and it was there was you know we could do them without breaking a sweat and it was just play and it was just a joy and i will miss it and with that we bring this episode to a close for the sake of full disclosure, we recorded this interview on Clubhouse uh, back during the height of the pandemic. And at the time, we didn't have the foresight to get everyone's permission to uh, be on the show, or at least to use their voices on the show. So the Q&A section is basically me rephrasing the questions that were asked by our friends and audience members for Sajith. So for all of those people who participated, thank you for the questions and uh, sorry we couldn't get you on the show. Maybe next time. If you do like what you're hearing, kindly give us a rating and review wherever you get your podcast. And more importantly, tell a friend or two or three. Until next time, we'll see you again on The Global Detail. This podcast has been a production of Carcutta Media in association with Perspicacity Media, LLC. All guest views are their own. If you have any questions, thoughts, or concerns, email us at globaldetailpodcast at gmail.com. Or you can contact us on Facebook and Twitter at Global Detail Pod. This recording or any portion thereof may not be reproduced or used in any manner whatsoever without the express written permission of the publisher, except for the use of brief quotations in a review. Copyright 2022 by Calcutta Media LLC. All rights reserved.